Hello, everyone. I uh, welcome you all to a brand new episode of Fridays with Dhavle. Today's topic is clinical observation, the master key to success in homeopathic management of children. I'm Dr. Nikita Oza. I'm a consulting homeopathic physician and pediatrician at Gujarat. Today, we'll see the meaning and definition of clinical observation. We'll see aphorism six, what does it tell about unprejudiced observer? We will understand it through various cases. There are three cases. One is of infant, second is of neonate, and the third one is of a school-going child. And at the end, we will summarize our learning. So what does observation mean? Any information that is taken in by the senses. Observation is one of the fundamental skills a physician must possess to become an ideal clinician. Clinical observation is basically defined as the act of measuring, questioning, evaluating, or observing a patient or a specimen from patient in healthcare in order to arrive at the clinical judgment. Now, you all must have heard Dr. William Osler. He was considered as the father of modern medicine. He is said that we must observe, record, tabulate, and communicate. We should use our five senses and should learn to see, to hear, to feel, and to smell, and know that by practice alone, we can become expert. But 100 years before Sir William Osler, our master, Dr. Hanneman, in his magnum opus, Organon of Medicine, mentioned that perceiving the true and only conceivable portrait of the disease demands total awareness, range, and resolution of sensory apparatus so that unprejudiced observation is rendered possible and so that the observer notices only the deviation from the former healthy state of the now diseased individual. So what does Dr. Hanneman mean by this in aphorism six? Let us understand that through cases. This case came to me in May month of 2018. 10 months male infant came to us with no significant history because the parents were always at work and the paternal grandmother was not observant. So we made certain clinical observations at the OPD. The baby was hungry after passing stool, would again eat and again pass stool. There was no change in facial contour while passing stool. There were loud sputtering stool. And on examination, there was red discoloration around the anus. If we see the ODP of the case, the complaints started since two days with vomiting one episode on the previous day but stopped after giving the over-the-counter medicine but then in one day in 24 hours baby passed seven to eight loose watery stools of moderate quantity yellowish non-offensive loud sputtering and query painless they were aggravated when the baby was playing outside in hot weather aggravated after breastfeeding and eating was not better with the oral antibiotics given. And as a strong accompaniment or the concomitant, we see that the appetite is increased and it is more increased after passing stool. There was reddish discoloration around the anus. Baby did not have any fever and was passing urine adequately. Other important history here was it was a hospital born full term normal delivered baby. Mother's obstetric history was not significant. Immunization was done. Milestones were well achieved. Diet, he was weaned at six months and now was taking soft food. In past history, at the age of six months, the baby had an acute febrile illness. Family history, paternal grandfather expired due to a myocardial infarction. On examination, weight was average to his peers. Vitally, the baby was stable and afebrile. Per abdomen, there was uh, no uh, abnormality seen, except bobble sounds were increased. 
the signs of dehydration. There was mild dehydration, which happened over the 24 hours. Rest can be. So, uh, what management is done in this case? Now, clinical diagnosis, it is possibly a viral origin acute gastroenteritis with mild dehydration. And for totality, we took boning Hussain approach because characteristic uh, concomitant and modalities were there. So on repertorizing, we see that LO socketrina, veratrum and podophyllum come up, but veratrum doesn't cover the red discoloration and podophyllum doesn't cover this increased appetite. So LO was finalized. In this case, susceptibility and postology is high. So LO socketrina 200 was given for four hourly for three days and then it was tapered to CDS to the next two days. Ancillary measures, ORS was given according to the weight of the baby. And most important was parents were oriented that investigation and hospitalization might be required if the dehydration worsens. But baby was better in five days and the course of the treatment was completed by giving calcarea FOS 200 after five days. What do we learn from this case? We learned that Prescribing totality was solely based on clinical observation. Here, we also see that there is a difference between an infant and an adult. An infant can go into rapid worsening of dehydration as we saw in just 24 hours. And common versus uncommon symptoms in this age group in infants is very important. Here, there is absence of discomfort and anorexia while in infants, crankiness and complete loss of appetite is very, very common. But it was not there in this case. So this is how this infant's case was dealt with with the help of clinical observation. We now go to the second case, which came to me in March 2017. It is a case of a four days female neonate uh, the parents are rack pickers, very poor condition, two siblings, a brother five years and a sister of two years. The baby was basically brought by Asha worker in view of low birth weight. So we made a few clinical observations at the OPD. Baby's head was larger comparatively to the thin lower extremity. There was dry wrinkled skin on face. And the umbilical stump was very unhealthy. And there was a slight purulent, sticky and malodorous discharge coming from it. Uh, if we see the chief complaints, it is basically the general nutrition and growth of the baby is affected. It is LBW because the weight done on day four is 2.3 kg. And the features of asymmetric IUGR. Since yesterday, the baby's crying has increased, but taking and tolerating breast feeds well as of now. Umbilical stump shows the sign of omphalitis. There is no change in activity and the stool and urine passing adequately and regularly. Significant birth history is that it is a home delivered baby and hence birth weight is not available. Mother's obstetric history in this case becomes very important because we need to understand why the baby has this clinical presentation. So there was no ANC care done. Mother had high grade fever in the third trimester. There was foul smelling amniotic fluid at the time of delivery. So for this, we examined the mother. On examination, she was afebrile, but was anemic and malnourished and had severe offensive leukorrhea. But the uh, child's immunization was done on day three, BCG and OPV was given, and the neonate was on exclusive breastfeeding. On examination, cryotone activity was normal, suck was good, but because of uh, loss of subcutaneous fat stores, the baby was hypothermic, uh, Otherwise, vitally stable, no signs of dehydration or sepsis as yet. Other general and systemic examination was NAD. On local examination of umbilical stump, we saw offensive discharge and there was mild erythema around, but yet there was no tenderness or abdominal wall cellulitis, which was a 
reassuring sign for us. Uh, now we, in this baby, we see a lot of different growth parameters which are not matching a normal, healthy, full-term delivered baby. So what is wrong with the baby? Let us see how we did the gestational assessment and other growth parameters which helped us in assessing the exact nutritional status of the baby. So on Ballard scoring, it, uh, we came to know that it is a full-term normal delivery. Uh, but what was important in this case was that abdominal circumference was less than the head circumference. Now, this is not what happens in a normal neonat. In normal neonat, the head circumference is less than the abdominal circumference. But this is the feature of asymmetric IUGR, where the head size is normal, but because the brain is spared, but the abdominal is smaller. Also, we see features of fetal malnourishment, LBW, and the pondrial index is also low in this case. So all this summarizes that the baby is asymmetric IUGR and the nutrition is grossly affected. Totality was based on Bogle's approach. We see that in this case, the pathology is deficient nutrition and an inflammatory process is going on. The pace of the disease is moderate to slow. The location is fetoplacental nutrition and immunological. And the pathological generals which we saw were emaciation of the lower part of the body because it is a brain sparing uh, nutritional problem. So abdomen and extremities showed emaciation due to the loss of fat. And because of that, there was a wrinkled face. We also saw that there are offensive discharges, especially the umbilical discharge. On repertorization, abrotinum, ichthyosa, natrimur, and chamomilla came up, but only abrotinum is the remedy which covers the emaciation of the lower limbs due to malnutrition in newborns who present with a wrinkled face. Uh, this is given in Fatix Materia Medica, Allen's keynotes and references were also taken from Clark Materia Medica. And so abrotinum was finalized as the remedy. Susceptibility is moderate in this case. Immunity is yet underdeveloped and deficient also because of the malnutrition of the mother. So a lower potential was selected. Abrotinum 30, 1p equal to 4 was given dissolved in EBM for three days. And mother was given creosote 30 TDS for five days. Parents were oriented that in case the cellulitis increase or the other signs of sepsis come up, they have to hospitalize the baby. Um, for hypothermia, uh, mother was oriented about the kangaroo mother care and was advised to expose it to the sunlight. Nutritional and fortified supplements were given to both mother and the baby. Follow-up, umbilical stump healed and shed well by ninth day. Abrotinum 30 weekly, one powder was continued till six months of age, followed by sulfur 200 single dose in the seventh month to complete the cure. Uh, mother was again better three with creosote and hence her CR was given. And with this, mother's nutritional status also improved and the quality of the milk also improved. And we got very good results in catch-up growth. After six months, the baby's percentiles improved on the growth chart. And very, very encouraging result was at the end of 10 months of age, it came within the normal parameters of its peers, which is very, very encouraging. Because otherwise, in asymmetric IUGR cases, it almost take one to two years of age to reach these parameters. The other very, very good result was that the baby did not have any further infections in the next one year. What do we learn in this case? Again, here diagnosis as well as homeopathic management was solely based on clinical observation. Also, we saw that identification of abnormal parameters in neonates is very, very important. 
we saw that there can be rapid progress of systemic sepsis, which is very different in children versus adults. We learned about the role of homeopathy in mothers and neonates in terms of growth and immunity. And we learned about Materia Medica correlation. Here, the picture of asymmetric IUGR was very well covered with Ebrotin. So overall, we see that in this case also, how much important clinical observations were. We now move to the case of an older child who is a school going child, nine years of age, came to me in October 2017, male child who was deaf and mute and was studying in second standard. Father was 40 years single, deaf and mute and was working as a cook. Mother had abandoned the child and absconded as soon as she came to know that the baby is also deaf and mute. The baby was already on regular homeopathic treatment. Pulsatilla was given as an acute and Silesia was given as constitutional because it was a very mature and a very obedient kind of a child. But what happened is I received a request call for home visit saying that the child is very sick and you please come because the child is not, uh, you know, ready to come to you and is being very cranky. Now, this was an alert call for me because otherwise this child is very calm very sweet and very obedient. So I made the visit and I saw that he was not ready to talk to me also, either through sign language or through the teacher, was very irritable and asked us all of us to go away. He was lying on his bed still and on the right side, not ready to go anywhere, just wanted to lie down. He had cough and he was holding his chest while coughing and was tachypneic. What happened was, 20 days back, there was a birthday party at the center and they had wafers and pastries after which he started with coryza, mild cough and yellow expectoration. Pulsatilla was given and he was better. But then he had lingering cough and in that lingering cough, Diwali came up. So he had cold drinks and snacks in the afternoon. Then he was exposed to firecrackers and smoke. What happened was, his cough increased. There were large bouts of cough, which was dry. And he had to hold his chest while coughing. And there was extreme irritability, aggravation when disturbed. The next day, he came down with fever of low grade and soles had perspiration, scar smelling. Was not ready to take allopathy at all. Just wanted to lie down. And the pain in the right side of the chest was better by lying on the right side. Quietly, he was lying. Examination was done. He had fever. He was tachypneic. SpO2 was normal. On examination, there were chest restrictions um, and right-sided crepitations. Investigations were done. There was neutropenia. ESR was increased. And there was patchy consolidation on the right lower zone on chest X-ray. So a diagnosis of viral lobar pneumonia was done. We take uh, Kent's approach in this case because there was a strong ailments from in Diwali heat. He had cold drinks and after that the complaint started. There was a rat irritability and there were other physical generals and particulars. Brania, Naxwamika and Arsal came up. Brania uh, was given because uh, lying on painful side, holding the chest while coughing and this kind of modalities were present only in Brania. Because the susceptibility and sensitivity was high, Brania 200 4 hourly was given for five days with the caution that if needed, he must needed to be hospitalized. But he was better and then Brania 200 was gradually tapered and stopped after four days and Silesia 200 was given to complete the course of treatment. Again, what do we learn from this case? Totality was formed with the help of the very, very characteristic concomitants and modalities which were obtained only by observing the child. Another very important learning was how the change in disposition occurs as a reaction to acute illness. A child who is very obedient and very sweet 
transformed into a very very irritable child who was not allowing anybody was not allowing anybody to disturb him we also learned about the relationship of branya and silicia and we saw the evolution and characteristics of a branya pneumonia in this case so all these three cases help us to understand the importance of clinical observation let us consolidate our learning from all these things the key points which we saw in all the cases were the type of clinical observations we need to do in children are objective symptoms and signs functional and structural abnormality reaction of the child change in disposition and the normal verbal communication inspection inspection is an integral part of any physical examination and never to be missed missed or overlooked especially in children physical examination solely helps the physician to avoid any assumptions and unnecessary errors in diagnosis as we saw in case 1 and 2 and in ordering investigations so the key thing to do is to spot the difference what difference children versus adult normal versus abnormal common versus uncommon symptoms and features pertaining to various periods of growth of children from neonate infant toddler school going child or an adolescent and last but not the least the difference between acute versus chronic diseases how to spot the difference in them now uh, if we read lesser writings of dr hanneman the medical observer he has written that the duty of the observer is only to take notice of the phenomena and their course not only that nothing actually present escape his observation but that also what he observe be understood exactly as it is what does that mean now in these three cases we saw that only clinical observation is important but their correct interpretations is ex exactly more important or equally important to that because it helps us in gathering objective symptoms both diagnostic and characteristic modality and concomitant it helped us in identifying deviation from normal and led us to clinical diagnosis in delineating change in disposition and perceiving the totality and of course in planning homeopathic management thus leading us to facilitate holistic care um apart from dr hanneman let us see what others stalwart advise us to do how to deal with children dr boger writes in homeopathy in diseases of children that sensations though are very scant in number in infantile diseases so he stresses upon presence of objective symptoms and to observe them he says that the most acute observer is the most efficient healer and he also points out differences in susceptibility in child and adult which we saw in all the three cases dr ml tyler <clears throat> in one of her other books pointers to the common remedies writes that in cases of children one must observe for yourself keep your eyes skin be alert and she says that in children what is easy to get is change in disposition due to illness which we saw in case 3 apart from that fear sensitiveness food cravings and loathings and gross or pathological symptoms with qualification again what we saw in all the three cases so both of them also stress upon clinical observation so finally what we learn <clears throat> that logical conclusions can be derived from the uh, observations based on what based upon our experiences knowledge and logical interpretation which is very very important thus transforming the observer to a practitioner and what kind of a practitioner a true practitioner of healing art the one who has knowledge of disease medicinal power choice of remedy medicine preparation doses repetition of doses 
how to remove obstacles to cure and one who knows to give judicious rational treatment the thing we saw in all the three cases and hence the actual master key to success in management of children is nothing but this thank you so much everyone for patient learn learning and listening uh, for any queries and suggestions please email me to my id which is written on the screen thank you once again